Well, good morning, Calvary family. We are so grateful that you're with us today as we worship uh, the Lord together. This is second Sunday of Advent. A couple of things I want to remind you of. First of all, our family Advent videos. If you have not participated in that, that started last week. The church will be sending you an email. All you have to do is click on that and follow that. It'll bring you right to those videos. And they've been a lot of fun. Hope that you're participating. If you're not, you can still start today. So if you're not a part of our email list, just fill out I'm new and we'll get your email address and then be able to fire that email out to you and you can participate in the family Christmas uh, Advent video series. And then coming up on the 18th, 17th, I guess it is, Thursday the 17th, and then the 18th of December here, we are looking for some folks to partner with our Compassion Committee. We are putting together 100 fruit baskets and boxes that have some other special gifts in them as well. We're looking to assemble those on Thursday the 17th, and then we're actually looking to start delivering those on the afternoon of the 17th and possibly on the morning of the 19th, depending upon how many volunteers we have. What we would ask of our volunteers is we have two different groups we're looking for. We're looking for one group that would be willing to uh, social distance with masks and assemble these boxes and these baskets. And that would be on the morning of Thursday the 17th. And then we're looking for 25 volunteers who would be willing to deliver baskets and boxes for each. So if we have 125 volunteers, take four boxes or baskets and bless some folks that we already have on a list here as a church, but some that you might have on a list of people that you say, you know what? These people have gone through a tough year this has been, especially for all of us, a real difficult uh, seven, eight, nine months with this whole COVID situation. We would love to bless a family with a basket, with a box. If you know of a family, if you would like to participate in that, we would love to have you help volunteer. And what we're gonna do is send out a little link on email. And once again, if you click on that link, That'll direct you to a spot on our website where you can fill out whether you'd like to volunteer to uh, assemble uh, baskets and boxes or whether you would like to uh, help deliver them or you might want to do both. So we have information that we'll be sending out for you about that. But during this time of year, we think so much about others. We think so much about giving. And this is a great way for you to participate, to get out, to do something that's going to bring encouragement and hope to other people, which is really kind of all the spirit of the season anyway. So if you'd like to participate, we'll be sending those links out for you, and you can uh, just follow those links. So, well, this is the second Sunday of Advent, and today we light the prophecy candle. And I'm reading out of Isaiah 40, starting in the third verse. Listen, it's a voice of someone shouting, Clear the way for the, through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys, level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. Let's continue to worship together this morning.
Amen. Calvary, would you join me as we pray together this morning? Father, we thank you so much this morning that we worship you, holy, almighty, loving, forgiving, merciful Father who sent Jesus to be Emmanuel, God with us. We praise your name this morning. And so, Father, as we sing out this next song, Emmanuel, the hallowed manger ground, with the remembrance that Jesus Christ came humbly in the form of a baby to be among us, to live among us, to endure all things with us, to connect with us on a, on a manner that is so beyond our imagination that a God like you would do such a thing. Would it bring us joy this morning, Heavenly Father? Bring us joy in the midst of whatever we find ourselves in this morning. Whatever, whatever circumstances and situations we find ourselves in, with the idea that Emmanuel, you, came down to be God among us, would that bring us joy as we sing out this next song? So we ask these things and we praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. What hope we hold this starlit night A king is born in Bethlehem Our journey long we seek the light That leads to the hallowed manger ground What fear we felt
Oh, come, let us bow at His feet. Oh, He has done great things. Come see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great things. Oh, He will have been. You conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, You have done great things. We dance in Your free. Awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, I say Your name lifted high. Oh, done great things You've been faithful through every storm You'll be faithful forevermore Oh, you have done great things And I know you will do it again your promises, yes and amen. God, you do great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Oh, evil of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, oh, you have some Today we are celebrating communion, the Lord's Supper. If you don't have the juice and bread yet ready, go ahead and pause the service today. Go get the elements you need and come back and be prepared to enjoy communion together as a family. <clears throat> today I want to read you a few verses from Luke 22. <clears throat> Jesus and the apostles sat down together at a table. Jesus said, I've been eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now, I won't eat this meal again until the meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> then he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. He said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Then <clears throat> he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. 
he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. <coughs> Jesus and the disciples were sharing a Passover meal. It looked back in history to the Exodus when God rescued his people. But now it would take on new meaning forever. Because Passover would no longer just mean the blood of a lamb shed for his people, but that Jesus, God's son, <coughs> excuse me, would become the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. But Jesus knew that that moment with his disciples was looking forward to something far greater, <clears throat> something that he said <laughs> would not be completed or fulfilled until the kingdom of God arrived in all its glory. So I want you to think about the Thanksgiving holiday we just came through. The food on your plate may have looked the same, turkey, potatoes, pie, but probably there were a lot fewer faces around the table. Uh, this has been a different holiday season than we've ever experienced for so many of us distant from friends and family at the very time when you want to come together with everybody. Well, <clears throat> we're all looking forward to spring. We're looking forward to summer. We're looking forward to when a vaccine's here and we can all get together again with family and friends and churches full and holidays will be real holidays once again. And folks, that's kind of a picture of this bread and this cup because not only does it represent the remembrance of what Jesus did in the past, but it's also a promise of the banquet that we're going to have with him in the future, in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> when Jesus returns and all his people are gathered together for all eternity, and there is a celebration to beat all celebrations. So we come today grateful, grateful because God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He paid the debt of our sin so that we could be right with him forever. His body was broken and laid in a grave so that your body could come out of a grave made whole. So we thank God for what he's already done, but we also look to the future with hope, knowing that the best is still ahead, that there is a great banquet table, which this bread and cup look forward to. <clears throat> Would you join me in prayer as we prepare to take the bread and the cup that remind us of his broken body and his shed blood? <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for the love that the Father had to send you to be our Savior and for the love you had for us to spread your arms and die on a cross to be the Savior of the world. And Lord, we thank you that you haven't left us alone, but your Holy Spirit is here with us, walking through these days, walking through this winter, not alone, but with your own presence to cheer and to guide us. And Lord, we thank you that this world is not all there is. But there is a kingdom coming that we look forward to, that we share with others, <clears throat> that we look forward to seeing you face to face at that great table. So this day, Lord Jesus, would your word and would your Holy Spirit renew us in our faith and in our hope and in our love, that we may worship you and serve you with a full heart, and we may look to our family, friends, and neighbors with a heart compassion and love that you have for us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time you can go ahead and pause the service and uh, or rather just uh, go ahead and distribute the elements as you partake of the bread and the cup. Thanks.
As we prepare to take our offering here today in the building, we want to thank you that have been so faithful in giving online and those who have sent in checks to the ministry of uh, Calvary Church. Thank you so much. Continue to pray for us. Uh, this is a time of year where uh, we have a lot of exciting things happening, and we have some great stuff in store for 2021 as well. So we could use uh, any prayer encouragement um, that you can send our way. Let's pray together this morning. Holy Father, we thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather online and gather as a church family here in the building to worship you. Uh, one of the greatest joys we have is worship of our God. And Lord, we look for the day when we can all uh, gather together to do that all in one place. We know that during this uh, COVID season, which just continues to, to uh, um, just seems like it just lags on, Lord. We, we look forward to being back together, but many of us cannot for health reasons. But thank you for uh, this opportunity that we have to gather even online. And thank you for those that are able to uh, tune in from other places outside of our community. Lord, just we pray a blessing upon them today. Thank you that we can uh, worship you. And Lord, we lift up uh, those families in our church that are going through real difficult times. We have had a number of families that have recently uh, lost loved ones, uh, some due to COVID, but some, um, Lord, just to illness and other factors. Lord, we just um, pray that you would bring uh, encouragement their way, that you would just uh, surround them um, with your presence and comfort. Lord, we pray for those um, not only watching online, but those within uh, our church that are attending today that are uh, and families that are dealing with uh, severe uh, health issues, um, going beyond COVID, just other uh, things that they're going through. We just pray you are the God uh, who heals. And we uh, lift these families, lift these individuals, these households up to you as people are going through these uh, challenging health uh, crises in many cases, Lord, we pray that uh, they would feel and experience uh, your peace uh, during the time of their lives where their lives are turned upside down. Lord, we pray for our country. Our country is divided and we're just going through, continue to go through just situations having to do with uh, um, the election from earlier in November. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, for Christians, and we pray for uh, those who uh, call upon your name, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to be uh, level-headed, and Lord, may we not enter into the fray of, of uh, some of the bad stuff that's happening, but may we be uh, people that stand for righteousness. May we continue to uh, not only love one another, but Lord, may we love our neighbors, and may we reflect you well, even during a time where our country and many of us are even um, just feeling um, the effects of what's happening nationally in our country. Lord, I'm thankful that uh, ultimately we look to you for strength. You tell us that you are our rock. Uh, you are the, the source of our salvation. You are the Prince of Peace. During this time of year, it's nice to know that there is something in our lives that is firm, that is not gonna change. You are the cornerstone. Uh, you are the beginning, you are the end. Everything is wrapped up in you. So we worship you and praise you uh, this morning, and we ask that you'll bless um, Pastor Mark now as he brings your word, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Calvary, good morning. Glad you can join us today. Well, I don't know about your house, but ours is starting to get ready to look like Christmas. Lights are going up. People are putting up trees. Christmas wreaths are being seen. It's starting to look and feel a lot like Christmas, which means we're going to be going to the Gospel of Luke for the next several weeks in a series that I've called When God Comes Close. The great story of Christmas first 
is that 2,000 years ago, God came close in Jesus Christ, God becoming man. But the great news doesn't stop there. That's the start. Because the reality is the Spirit of God still comes close. What God did 2,000 years ago in Mary was to prepare the way for God's Spirit to do something miraculous in you. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, let's face it, most people, the Spirit of God is mysterious. Jesus put it this way, it's kind of like the wind. You can see what it's doing, you can hear it, but you can't see it. You don't know where it's coming from, you don't know where it's going. Um, if you're ever out deer hunting, deer hunters always pay attention to the wind because the wind can give you away. So I've got a little thing called a wind indicator. And when there's just the lightest breeze, that will show you which way the wind is blowing. Well, folks, in the Gospel of Luke, we're going to see which way the Spirit is blowing because when the Spirit of God shows up, new life begins. It happened in Mary 2,000 years ago, and it happens in us today. Let's go inside and open up Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Okay, folks, so we're in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. If you've got it open, I'm going to start reading at verse 26 and want to invite you to read along. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, <clears throat> for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. <coughs> the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. <clears throat> Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, in this Christmas season, we come back to your word to hear again the story that many of us have heard for years, decades. Some of us, since we have been little children, we have heard the great news of the birth of your Son, our Savior. I pray this day, Lord God, in this Christmas season, which is so different from any that we've ever known before, would you remind us of what stays the same, that you love us, that Christ has come to rescue us, and that your spirit is here to walk with us as we live for you. Would you use this word, Lord God, to feed our faith today? In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> hmm. So this series is called When God Comes Close. And the thing that I want you to remember today, folks, is that when God comes close, new life begins. It happened in Mary 2,000 years ago. God was about to do something in the world unlike anything he had ever done before. And when God came close to Mary through the Holy Spirit, the Christ child was conceived in her womb, really a new creation, a new start for humanity. And that same Holy Spirit who did a miraculous work in Mary 2,000 years ago, <clears throat> that Holy Spirit is here with us today. 
to do a miraculous work in us. <coughs> so today I want to talk to you about three miracles, three mysteries. God coming close in Mary, God coming close in Jesus, and God coming close in us by the Holy Spirit. First, Mary. It is a mystery and she might not seem like miracle material. Ordinary girl, small town with a bad reputation, out in kind of a backwater community far from the limelight of the world. Uh, we don't know much about her life other than it seemed exceedingly ordinary. Poor family, little education, very limited hopes for the future. But there was a bright spot. She was engaged. She was looking forward to a wedding. No doubt she was eager to start a new home with Joseph and begin a family. But she's exceedingly ordinary, ordinary hopes, ordinary problems. For her life, a good day was a day when you had enough food to eat and nobody was there to put you in danger. And yet, God's eye was on this young woman to do in her a miracle unlike anything the world had ever seen. Because the Jewish people had been waiting <coughs> for centuries for God to fulfill his promise and send a Messiah. And Mary was chosen by God to be the mother through whom the Savior would come. <coughs> God says that you will call his name Jesus. That name means salvation. That he will be from the line of David, descendant of royalty, heir to a throne, but not just a throne like the world knows, a kingdom that would never end. <coughs> and something that has never been done before. A child conceived without a human father. Uh, Luke, who writes the gospel, is a doctor. And no doubt he had seen many babies brought into the world. And no doubt he had visited many mothers in their time of need. But as Luke tells this story, he tells of a birth unlike any that has ever happened in history. So Mary has a very simple question. How? I am a virgin. I'm engaged. I will be married. But she had not been with a man. <coughs> Hear the Lord's answer from the angel. The Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The baby will be holy and called the Son of God. So this is where the Holy Spirit comes close to Mary. Uh, we first meet the Spirit of God on the first line of the Bible. Genesis begins with these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. That's the same picture that we have of Mary. God's Spirit hovering over her, creating new life, a new creation, something that God had never done before. <coughs> God entering the world, taking on human flesh. The same picture is given to us in um, Exodus, where God has a tabernacle, a tent, where he meets with his people, and the Spirit of God hovers over that tabernacle, the presence of God, and here, God has come to meet with his people in a brand new way. <coughs> it's the Spirit of God who does a miracle in Mary that will change not only her life, but will change the course of human history. So that brings us to the second miracle. Jesus Christ, Son of Man, Son of God. Jesus Christ, the one and only God-man, fully God, fully human in one person. No one like him before, no one like him since. The God of all eternity takes on flesh and blood and skin and bones, hands and hair and a heartbeat. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve turned against God, <clears throat> there had always been this problem of God and humanity dwelling together, God's holiness, God's perfect righteousness, and our sin 
always creating a problem, always creating a need for reconciliation, a need for reunion, a need for redemption. Well, here in the person of Jesus Christ, God and humanity are united together for eternity in the person of Jesus Christ, God's Son, born of a woman. <coughs> Nothing else like this, the virgin birth, a conception without a human earthly father. So in these miracles, in Mary and in Jesus, they have a couple things in common. First, they're both invisible. Uh, Mary did not walk around with a glowing halo. The neighbors didn't know what had happened. There was no way she could explain this to her family. All they would notice was that she would become pregnant and her belly would grow and eyebrows would raise and people would have a lot of questions. And Mary only had one soul in all the earth that she could tell. What would her parents think? What would the neighbors think? What would Joseph do? All this was cloaked in questions and worry, and yet God had done in her a miracle that she believed and knew was true, but the rest of the world could not see. So also with Jesus, when he was born, there was no glowing halo around his head like in a medieval artwork. If you would have looked in on the baby Jesus, you would have seen a child eating, sleeping, crying, repeat, do over. You could have watched him grow as a boy. He would have blended in with the other kids. You would have seen him as a teenager becoming a man, learning how to do his father's work, eating supper at night, going to bed in the morning, getting up and doing it all over. Frankly, you could have walked by him every day and you wouldn't have known anything was different. The miracle that God did was invisible. It was also disruptive. Mary's life was turned upside down. All of a sudden, she was a target of shame, people thinking that she had been unfaithful to Joseph, Joseph troubled. Whatever her plans for a normal life looked like, the miracle of God turned it upside down. So also with Jesus. When Jesus did finally reveal himself to the world in his public ministry of message and miracles, it was disruptive for his family, for his community, for his entire nation, for the whole world. Some look at Christ and they see in him the Savior of the world, the Son of God. Others find in him a scandal and a stumbling block. And as Jesus was disruptive in Israel 2,000 years ago, Jesus is still disruptive today because in Christ, God has shown up and walked into a broken world and some look to him for help and hope and others turn their back on him and walk away. So it was invisible. It was disruptive. But third, both had a glorious end. Mary may have had challenges like she never could have imagined. I mean, how do you prepare to raise a son of God? And yet, if you read on a little further, she has a song to sing. She will praise God because God has been good to her. And she says, all, <coughs> all generations will call her blessed. As disruptive as this was, <coughs> God had a glorious plan for Mary. And so also with Christ. While the disruption of Jesus might lead to the cross, it is the cross that led to the resurrection. It is Jesus who said that he would bring glory to the Father and the Father would glorify him. And it is Jesus who opens up to us glory, a new way to live for God, a new way to have peace with God, a new power to live for God. <coughs> so in Jesus, God in the flesh, a miracle happened that was at first invisible. It was certainly disruptive, but the end of it is glory. So that brings us really to our third mystery, our third miracle, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit in us because God still comes close. Uh, the Bible says that God is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. The Father in love for the world gave the Son. The Son fulfilling the Father's plan gives the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you is give you back to the Father as a new son or daughter in Christ. Of all the four gospel writers, Luke is unique in that he was the one 
who never met Jesus in the flesh, he knew Christ in the same way we do through the work of the Holy Spirit. He was a Gentile, not Jewish. He didn't grow up in Israel. He grew up in Antioch. That was a Syrian city. When he tells the story of Jesus, he's not telling what he saw. He is telling what he heard, what he investigated, the witnesses that he interviewed who were there with Jesus. When we go from Luke's first book, the gospel, to the book of Acts, the second part, Luke shows up around Acts chapter 16 when all of a sudden start, Luke starts writing about we and us, we set sail, we arrived, we departed. Luke became a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul and a missionary on his journeys, but we have no idea who first introduced Luke to the good news of Jesus Christ, that God loved him, that he had sent Christ to be a savior, and Luke had experienced a new birth in the Holy Spirit by putting his faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so it's no wonder that of all the gospel writers, Luke has a very high interest in the work of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> because he was a man who had come to know Christ through the Spirit and was moved to put that story down, motivated by the Spirit, energized by the Spirit, <clears throat> when we get to Acts chapter 24, Luke and Paul and the others spend two years in a city called Caesarea. It's on the coastline of Israel. Paul was under arrest. Luke and other friends were taking care of him. Uh, Paul needed some taken care of, and Luke happened to be a doctor. <clears throat> but it was in that two-year time frame that Luke had opportunity to visit with those who lived in Israel when Jesus was there. He had opportunity to interview the eyewitnesses probably had opportunity to sit down and hear the stories of Jesus' own family members, people like James and his brothers. Out of that, Luke writes the story of the gospel of Christ, not only so that we can know that God came close 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus, but that we can know that God still comes close by the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus teaches on prayer and he says that God is a good father who gives good gifts and the greatest gift God the Father can give you is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says that the Father gives the Holy Spirit to whomever asks. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a very religious man named Nicodemus who had a lot of information about God and a lot of religious experience and tradition in his past. But Jesus said he needed something new, something that only God could do for him. He needed a new birth, a birth from above, a birth by the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus found it confusing, and Jesus said that it is as simple as putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And when we trust Jesus to be our Savior and Lord, his gift is the Holy Spirit who brings us into a new birth relationship with God. So, that, folks, that's really what today's message is all about. That God was born of a woman so that men and women like you and I could be born of God. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary so that the Holy Spirit could do a work of new life in us who put our trust and faith in Him. If you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ... I'm going to ask, are you ready to do that today? Are you ready in simple faith to say, Jesus, I know I need you. I need forgiveness. I need eternal life. I need you to be my shepherd and lead me home. If you're willing to do that today, Jesus is standing with open arms to bring you into the family of God. And not to leave you alone while you walk your days here on earth, but to pour into your life the Holy Spirit who will make you new from the inside out. It is an invisible work. Uh, you're not going to walk around with a glowing halo the next day. Uh, it may be disruptive in your life. Other people may not understand what God is doing in you. Some may even take offense at it. Don't lose heart. The outcome of what God wants to do in your life through the Holy Spirit is glorious. Because what he wants to do is not just to change your plans, but to change you in the direction of joy and hope and peace and love. 
so that the Apostle Paul puts it this way in his letter to the second Corinthians. He says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and we can see and reflect the glory of God. And the Lord who is spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Friends, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ today and asked him to make you new, a child of God by a work of the Holy Spirit, would you do it today in simple faith, confessing your sin and a need for a Savior and believing that what God wants to give you is not just a home in heaven in the future, which is great, and not just a pardon from your sins in the past, which is awesome, but his own presence living in you today and forever. By that Holy Spirit, we can call God Father, knowing that he calls us his sons and daughters. <coughs> Recently, Karen and I were sitting at a roadside rest, and there was a massive semi-trailer with a wind turbine blade on it that was probably about 100 yards long. And it's fascinating to drive past those fields of wind turbines Think of those huge machines are being moved by a breeze that moves across the prairie and how much energy and electricity is generated by that invisible force moving every day across the prairie. But you know what? For me, <coughs> the most important breeze is not what's blowing out there on the prairie. It's not what's moving wind turbines. The most important breeze in my life is what's going on right inside my own two lungs. Now, if you've watched me preach, you know I cough these days. <clears throat> the truth is I've been doctoring quite a while for asthma. So here's the breath that really matters to me. It's called a nebulizer. <clears throat> I always told my kids not to vape, and now I find myself vaping albuterol. Why? <clears throat> because... The breeze that every one of us need every day, every hour, every minute, is not just the breeze that blows out across the world, causes storms and moves windmills. The breeze that we need is the one that brings life and oxygen into our lungs and in our blood every moment of every day. And you know what that breeze is carrying for me? Medicine, because I've got a problem on the inside. I've got a problem <clears throat> that I can't fix. But hope is on the way because there is a, a doctor and a medicine and a treatment and behind all that, a good God who is a healer. And in the meantime, <coughs> the breeze that I need in my life is not simply the oxygen that we all need physically every day, as important as that is. Ultimately, the breeze that I need in my life is the breeze, the wind of the Spirit of God the breath of God, the same breath of God that inspired the scriptures will live in us. The same spirit who hovered over the waters in the beginning is hovering over us. The same spirit who dwelt in the tabernacle with Israel long ago, that spirit of God wants to tabernacle with us. The place that God wants to live these days, folks, is not in a temple far away built by human hands. You are the temple where the Spirit of God wants to live. So 2,000 years ago, <coughs> God was born of a woman so that today men and women like you and I can be born of God. Folks, that work is done in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you've never received that gift for yourself, I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now and ask the Lord to give you the new birth. <clears throat> Father in heaven, I thank you that in your love for the world, you gave Jesus to be our Savior, to bear the sin of the world and gift us with his righteousness. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that your gift is not only to be pardoned from sin, but a new life, a new relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, would you take me now, who I am, where I am, what I am, and would you make me yours, and would you make me new? 
would you fill me with the gift of the Holy Spirit so that I know that God is my Father and I know that I am God's child and I know that you are at work in my life in these circumstances, through these problems, you are at work conforming us to the glorious image of Jesus Christ. Lord, would you give me all that you desire and make me all that you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to have a closing song, and I'm going to have a few directions for you as we wrap up today. Behold the star of Bethlehem, the Word of God has become flesh, and unto us a child is born, the Savior of this broken world. Oh, he Okay, just a couple quick instructions for you before we wrap up today. If you're kind of new to Calvary over the last year, maybe you've never even been in the building, but you've been watching online, we've got a gift we'd like to give you for Christmas. It's a little devotional by Max Lucado called Celebrating Christmas with Jesus. And if you would uh, visit our website and leave your information or call into the church office, we'd love to get you a copy of this gift from Max Lucado. 
Uh, second, even more importantly, if today you prayed for the first time to receive Jesus Christ and the gift of new life in the Spirit, would you let us know? We want to visit with you. We want to celebrate you. And again, we've got a gift for you. It's called the New Believer's Guide to Effective Christian Living. And what it will give you is just uh, a little guidance, a little encouragement on how you begin to grow in this new faith relationship with Jesus. Last thing I'm going to let you know about is uh, it's called the Zoom foyer. Uh, one of the things a lot of us miss right now during this COVID time is just the opportunity to visit and see each other casually before and after church. Well, here's what we're going to be doing every Sunday morning at 1030. There's an opportunity for you to join us in a Zoom foyer. Nothing formal, but just a chance to see each other, say hello, and check up on life a little bit. So what do you do? You're going to go to our church website. You're going to go to the tab online service, and you're going to scroll down right below the video service, and you'll see a Zoom invite link there where you can just click on it, 1030. I'll be in the Zoom foyer until about 11 a.m., and it'd just be a chance to check in and say hi, see how you're doing, and maybe pray together if you'd like. But I uh, want to make you aware of that. We're going to be doing it every Sunday. It's kind of a new thing as we walk through this winter season. We want to make that opportunity available. So, again, thanks for joining us today. We're going to close with a benediction. Father in heaven, you are a good Father who has given us good news in Jesus Christ and what you want to do in us through the Holy Spirit is a good work. May we simply trust you in these days of challenges and troubles and distancing, Lord. May we know that you're not distant, you're not far, but you're a God who is here with us. You're a God who has already come close. May we rest in that today. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Have a great day.